Hello and welcome to another episode of Burning Books Truths. So I'm going to choose read from Hunter S. Thompson again, Generation of Swine, and I'm just going to find a title that looks interesting and read from it, I guess. So I'm going to go choose a, I'll choose a random page. Which story is this? Last Dance in Dumbtown. I was sitting at the bar in the Woody Creek Tavern last week, sipping my normal large flagon of whiskey and getting cranked up to the neck right level of shambolic alcoholic frenzy for an afternoon of fast driving on the local highways, back roads and maybe even a few residential districts when a man from Miami came in and said he had a fast motorcycle to sell for $5,000 cash. It was a cafe eraser, he said. A fancy little hot rod with a silver engine the size of a football and hand-tooled Italian leather seats. And he had it just outside in the parking lot, strapped down with bit pink bungee cords on the back of what looked a flat bed Peter built truck. Nobody paid any attention to him. There was a film on TV about a team of French scientists trying to load a polar bear onto the fan tail of what like a Caribbean tourist yacht. The beast was howling and thrashing, then it wrapped up in a steel mesh net. And then a woman wearing a topless bikini came out and shot it in the back with a tranquilizer gun. It's less funny. It was the middle of a show afternoon on a cold day in the Rockies. There were only a few paying customers at the bar, all of them deeply engrossed, engrossed in their own business. They were locals, cowboys and gamblers, and the last thing any one of them needed was a high-speed Italian motorcycle. The stranger took a long look at the place, went, then he slumped on a bench near the window and ordered a slow gin sling. Who gives a damn about polar bears? He muttered. They're dumber than dogs and they'll turn you on for no reason on, at all. They'll turn you on. Fucking hell. Turn on you. Jesus, what the fuck is through my head today? Fucking polar bears. Turn. turn t what, there's nothing. What the fuck? Anyway, carrying on. I saw Cramwell's shoulder on the stool at the far end of the bar where he'd been nursing a moose head all morning, brooding helplessly on the nine-point spread for the Celtics Rockets game that was coming up on TV around sundown. He had bet heavily on the Rockets and given 16-1 to 1 against four straight. Now he's feeling deep. Oh. The day was already queasy. The morning had bloomed warm and bright. But by noon, it was raining fitfully and the sky was turning black. By 2.30 we were getting thunder and lightning, the first spring storm of the season. The polar bear film was still rolling. The brutes were being taken off to some zoo on the outskirts of Paris, where they would be loaded with electrical implants in the softer parts of their bodies and then turned loose on the slopes of Mount Aratar. The reasons would never be explained, it was one of those top secret international security gigs that only the French could do properly. And meanwhile, on the other side of the world, in a pure behavioural sink, 8,000 feet up the Rockies in a roadhouse and two lane blackjack on the lyric side of the mirror, some nervous little footbag from Miami was trying to pedal a slick Italian motorcycle. I'm doing my best to fake American accent now. Uh, Cromwell, uh, I didn't basically have the point, and then he stood up and pulled a pair of red uh, love glove bags out of his hip pocket. Okay, he said, you're going to the right pace. Uh, let's have a look at the bugger. What? So the stranger, you want to buy it? Uh, not yet, so come on, but I will if it's fast. Uh, I'm in Vegas now. A lot of money. There was a hoot of some laughter from somewhere back in the kitchen, but I kept a stretch of straight face. The price was $10,000, said the stranger, but it was the newest in the neighbourhood, so we'd let it go for five. And only one of those things ever built, he said. I was sold to Steve McQueen for something like forty thousand dollars. Which one of us should ride it? Cromwell said. I never wanted to run it against my jeep for about a mile down the road to the gravel pit. We went outside in the rain and unloaded the slick little speedster down off the flatbed truck. Cromwell pulled on his motor's cross gloves. If it's faster than my jeep, he said. I'll give you ten grand, but it's not giving me for nothing. The stranger stared at him. Nobody else said a word. You nuts! He said finally, You want me to race my Ducati against a goddamn Jeep for ten grand? Ten thousand dollars? Why not? said Cromwell. Let's go do it before the storm hits. We all agreed 
It was winner take all. Cromwell backed his rotten looking mud covered jeep out the corner of the parking lot and aimed it down the road. Well, the man from Miami got it back, turned up. I just ran behind Cromwell's machine and pulled a Parnelli Jones Barger bumper sticker off the rear end. The thing was a monster, so fast and strong that he was afraid to even drive it on the roads in Colorado. The engine was 600 horsepower, turbo powered Ford Coastway. Monday change hand, we serious talk about the uh, honest old, that's cool. Uh, man called Tex, uh, so important, uh, we call the uh, catch for that purpose. We're all involved in this game, all that, but nobody really cared. It was just about them, the whole world of bullets were booming and quest and good, all oh, satellites. Almost he turned like a gas bomb and fell on the mark side, like sending a glass of a uh, cloud of uh, nasty electrical smoke. We all knocked stupid. Next sound I remember hearing was a woman screeching, Please, Tex, don't die. Then I felt myself being dragged across the road by people I didn't recognize. There was a uh, smell of burning hair all around us, and I heard voices talking about uh, oxygen and uh, heart failure, and it burned like a human cinder. No money changed hands today. We never saw the man from Miami again. Several days later, I went back to the tavern and had more or less what happened. We were whacked by a huge ball of lightning that bounced once in the parking lot and then rolled down the road about 200 feet before it exploded in the creek. Tex lived, but his uh, heart was like a small lump of charcoal and his face shriveled up like a raisin. The doctor in Phoenix said his body was about 400 years old. And if you ever bumped up against anything solid, it would probably break with a cheap glass. Never saw him again. His family put him in a rural hotel somewhere in Arizona, where he remained helpless for whatever was left of his life. There's still a small crater in the parking lot across the road from the Woody Creek Tavern. With a crust of black ash on its edges and a pool of stagnant water at the bottom. I have not been back there since I quit work and moved north. For professional reasons. quite a sad end to that one obviously like I probably went a bit overboard in some of the accents there <laughs> to say the least but um it's quite a it's quite a funny like observational bittersweet thing at the end I suppose with um yeah it's like a slice of Americana I suppose it's all it isn't it that's only like, like three pages and what without any words but it's another interesting one. Uh, oh. Yeah, so Jim Joy Joy flipping in and out of this book. It's like just it's very it's very much a book you can just flip in and out of really. I suppose that's the same with all of the rest of Thompson's work really. It's just nice short extracts of kind of stream of consciousness thoughts, which is I find really useful because that's how I write myself, is stream of consciousness. Very like free flowing kind of observing, a lot of observing, kind of you know, <clears throat> observing little moments and little peculiarities and all the rest of it. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of like I kind of get how he's very much a writer of an urban kind of malaise, but also a rural malaise and kind of the weird corners of America, I suppose. Um, well, it's mostly America, isn't it? From what I know of Hunter S. Thompson. So, anyway, that's been another Burning Book Truths. This is number two. And uh, what was that one called again? I can't remember. Oh, Last Chance in Dumbtown. Last Chance in Dumbtown. <laughs>